Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another Nose Man Nose tutorial. In this little video, we are going to investigate cell packing. Now, if you don't know what cell packing is, uh, there's nothing I can do for you. But basically, we are going to create a series of clones, uh, let's call them cells, and as they move around each other, they're going to deform in order to avoid any collisions. Now, this technique does not use any dynamic simulations. There's no cloth simulation, there's no soft body dynamic simulation, which makes it uh, more controllable and much faster. And uh, this particular technique I'm gonna show is fully procedural and it supports, as you can see, animation. But it's mostly catered at spheres. So, without further ado, press the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you can see all the great videos coming from Noseman Nose. I'll begin by explaining the main premise we are going to use to control the geometry avoidance. So in a new scene, I'm going to create a sphere primitive. As usual, I'm going to turn on the display raw shading line so I can see the topology. And I'm going to change this sphere from standard type in the attributes manager to an icosahedron. And that's because it has more homogeneous uh, topology and it will allow for a better deformation because we're going to use the formers actually. Now I'm going to set the segments to uh, 48. Uh, we can always change this uh, depending on uh, how much fidelity we want on the final effect. So what I'm going to do is use a smoothing deformer. So from the deformers menu, I'm going to set a smoothing deformer and I'm going to put it as a child of the sphere. Now let's go and check a few things out here at the deformer attributes. First of all, the number of iterations controls how much this is going to iterate and smooth out the polygon mesh. Now it just becomes smaller because it's a uniform object and everything pulls equally upon itself, and not very much equally. You will see that as this gets smaller, it creates some little odd lines, but that's uh, irrelevant. I'm gonna set this to something like 50 and press enter. Now the stiffness controls how much of the original shape we're gonna keep and how much we're gonna let it smooth out. I'm gonna set it to zero for now. So this is the beginning. The second part is to confine this smoothing to a certain area. So to do that, we're gonna mask the smoothing deformer like we can do with most deformers. And in the fall off where the fields are, I'm gonna set a linear field. Now what I'm gonna do here is instead of having the ramp in the remapping tab, I'm gonna set the inner strength to 100%. So this particular field now is either 100% in effect or outside 0%. And look what happens. I'm gonna drag this over here and I'm gonna make it slightly narrower. And what you will see is that when the field enters the sphere, this smoothing only gets applied to this part of the sphere, anything that's within the influence of the field. And this is one of the properties we are going to take advantage of to create those avoidances. Because it's my understanding that when two spheres are close to each other and are avoiding each other, so for example, if I take this sphere and make a copy, I'm gonna drag in and press Command or Control. I'm gonna to go to my rotation tool and I'm gonna rotate it the other way around. I could have done it another way, 180 degrees. I'm gonna pull it out and we will see that creating avoidance between these two spheres requires that those previously intersecting surfaces, so if I turn these off, you'll see that those parts of the spheres were intersecting, those parts receive that smoothing effect. And then by controlling exactly where the masking is going to be, we can create more or less more avoidance. Now, this is not a perfect method by any stretch of the imagination. And if you want to control if there's gonna be any little bit of um, overlapping, you have to go to your smooth object and increase the actual iterations. That's going to make it slightly slower, especially if we start dealing with hundreds or thousands of objects, but it will give you a viable solution. So I'm going to set this to 150 and set the other smoothing to 150 
as well. And then if you want to create a situation where we don't have these jaggies, we are going to go and apply another smoothing underneath that one. So for now, I'm going to put it here, close this and drag this down. And I can control how much of the original geometry I can have and how many iterations I need to have. So if I copy drag this down here, pressing command, and bring this up here because the deformers execute in the sequence they're placed in the object manager. Now you can see that we have a really nice avoidance between these two spheres. So this is the main premise, as I said previously. Now we need to find a way to generate these fields, not manually, but using a procedural way so that the smoothing will only apply to the parts of the spheres that are intersecting. So let me delete everything except for the original sphere. And what I'm going to do is use a MoGraph cloner to make copies of these spheres. So let me create a nice grid array. And I'm going to set this to, let's say, 8118. So we have 64 spheres. I'm going to work with these 64 spheres for now. And the next thing I want to do is, first of all, create some sort of position randomization. Let's go to the cloner and let's go to the MoGraph menu and bring up a random effector. In the random effector parameter tab, I'm going to get rid of the Y. I don't want them to go up and down. I only want them to be on the same plane. But you can see that now they're kind of moving in all sorts of different directions and some sort of overlap is occurring. Now the next thing I want to do is create an initial position of these spheres where they are avoiding each other. Select the cloner, go back to the MoGraph menu, and let's get the magnificent push apart effector. The push apart effector uses a radius to push things apart. And we know that my sphere is 100 centimeters. So if the push apart is set to 100, then it's going to try and make everything be at least 100 centimeters away from each other. And the iteration number controls how many iterations it's going to use to do that avoidance. I don't want these to be avoiding each other that much. So first of all, let's go to the cloner and let's bring them together. So I'm going to decrease the step size. I'm going to bring them together and you can see the push apart effector is pushing them apart. So although they're coming together, they're still trying to avoid each other. Because we don't have enough iterations. That's why we get these overlaps. But we want these overlaps because these are going to become the overlaps we are going to use. Now in my random effector, I'm going to go back to the effector tab because if I press play, nothing is really happening. I want to have some sort of animation. So I'm going to set the random mode from the effector tab to turbulence or noise. And if I press play, you'll see that these are moving around. This is a nice way to add procedural random movement. Okay, so I'm going to go and turn it off for now. I'm going to activate it later. I just wanted to show you what I'm going to do later on. The last thing I'm going to do is control the amount of overlap we have here. And I can do this by decreasing the radius in the push apart effector. And this way I can bring them together to create a more tight fit over here. Fantastic. So let's assume that we are happy with the position of our spheres or cells, so to speak. So let's begin the process. I'm going to use a volume, volume builder. And what I'm going to do is in this volume builder, I'm going to drag the cloner and we get an SDF. For more details, if you go on Cineversity, you will find a whole series dedicated to volumes. Now, what happens in this case is that wherever we have two objects which intersect each other, the values in there are lower than the ones outside because they are negative. And that is what we are going to take advantage of so that we can create our effect. So now that we've set up the actual data structure we're going to use to identify the overlaps, I need something which I can apply this data to. Now, if I go and apply my smoothing to the cloner itself, that's not really going to work because it's going to change the structure of our data. So we're going to do something very simple. I'm going to select the cloner and I'm going to make an instance of it. So just go up here, 
and go and create an instance. This is going to create a copy of the cloner. And let me go and turn off the volume builder. And this, being a copy of this, allows us to apply anything we want to it. Let's go and add our smoothing deformer to it. Fantastic. And you can see what's happening. Let's go and change those parameters to what we had before. So stiffness zero and let's say 50 iterations. They're nice and small. And let's go now to the fall off of the smoothing deformer and let's drag the volume builder in volume object mode. So it takes the volume data. You can see already something's happening. Now we do have some weird data reversal here. The data we're receiving here is the inverse of what we want. And we're going to do a few more adjustments. First of all, the volume builder, in order to have a more smooth transition from its own data to the data of whatever it's doing here, we just need to set the sample mode instead of nearest to linear. And it's going to smooth out the, the whole operation. There you go. And you can see that we're getting the opposite of what we would expect to get. Not that this is not interesting, but it's not what we're looking at. So we need to do something to invert this data. And for this, I'm actually going to use a range map layer. And currently, it's set to 1 to 1. So 0 to 100 to 0 to 100. And what this does, it's just like a range mapper in Expresso. It takes a value on the input, which is what it reads underneath, and it converts it to a value out here. So 0 will become 0, 1 will become 1, but I want to make the max output much smaller and I want to make it negative because I want to invert the data in one go. So minus 15. And look at that. We're getting exactly what we expected. So this is pretty much the essence of the technique. I'm going to show you a few ways to refine a few things, but that's all it takes. It takes the understanding that a volume is built in a particular way. So go watch those university tutorials so you get a better idea of how volumes, fogs, and SDFs work. And then use this in some sort of creative way to drive one set of parameters. In this case, the smoothing mask. We're masking the smoothing effect to only be applied where the SDF is higher but because essentially it's lower, we invert it and we play with this value. Now, let me show you a few numbers. You can change the max output number to affect how much of the masking gets propagated. You can see it sort of changes a little bit. But if you want to control the distances between these cells, it's better if you go to the volume builder and you change some parameters, for example, the interior voxel range and the exterior voxel range. And you can do these by experimenting. No one's going to say anything. And let's uh, see what happens. And of course, uh, the voxel size. Let's make it 20. Let's make it bigger and see what happens. Yep. Or let's make it smaller and see what happens. There you go. So the voxel size, because it's smaller, it allows for a bit more detailed data to exist in our system. And therefore, it drives the actual smoothing with higher accuracy. So let's go and make this a bit better looking. Go to Girl Shading. Let's activate our screen space ambient occlusion to get the darkness between these. And if you want to make it a bit darker, then you go to your options, configure, go all the way to the enhanced OpenGL tab, open up the screen space ambient occlusion, and you can change the radius. You can see the ambient occlusion is growing. You can change the power to make it darker and you get a better idea of what's going on. Let me navigate here. Look at that. We have our cell packing. And because everything is calculated in real time, then if I go press play now, nothing's going to happen. We don't have any motion. But if I go now to the random and I add a different random mode in the effector tab and set it to noise and press play, you will see that although it's not extremely fast, we will see animation happening. Fantastic. The reason they changed position is that the type of randomness that the noise makes is different than the randomness that the actual random makes. Maybe I can set it to Gaussian and see what happens. But anyhow, 
It may seem slow, but this is uh, much, much faster. Put it back to random. It's much, much faster than if you try and do this using some sort of uh, dynamic simulation. And uh, the result is not that bad. And don't forget, because we're using a cloner, you can make a copy of this cloner to represent smaller spheres, which are the nuclei that don't have any of the deformation from the smoothing. So you can create a very interesting and very good looking animations and stills using this technique. Let me finalize this by adding uh, the extra smoothing. So I'm going to call this smoothing interior and I'm going to turn on my grow shading lines and go in and see you can see now I can identify certain areas which are a bit rougher and I can go and add my secondary smoothing underneath this and you can see it's going to smooth them out quite a bit and then I can play around with the stiffness maybe set it to 85 percent and maybe make the iterations just two to get rid of those little edges so you have full control over how you're going to do this. Another thing you can do is that if you're generally happy with the main configuration of this, you can always bake it as an alembic file. And then you bring it in as an actual baked mesh and you can have real-time feedback and apply your secondary smoothing on that. Finally, at any given moment, you can go to your cloner and say, I want two rows of these. So just press one, wait for the whole thing to calculate. And now we have two rows of cells. You have to wait for the smoothing sometimes to calculate properly. There you go. And if I bring them closer to each other, I'm going to bring them another 140. Press enter. Wait for a few seconds. And now let's see all the spheres are nicely avoiding each other. So there you have it. This is how you create cell packing the nose man way. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to press the subscribe, the bell, send me an email, postcard, and uh, yeah, uh, any questions please in the comments section so you can feed my imagination for more and very interesting tutorials. Thanks for watching.